We had this wonderful dog, Penny. She had this incredible personality that just worked her way into your hearts. We lost her this summer. She developed cancer, which spread very quickly. A week after we found out that she had cancer, we had to put her down. She was no longer comfortable. She was having trouble breathing, couldn't do little things like go up and down a few stairs at a time, and it was so sad. And my wife and I like to tell people that we're suffering from post-traumatic dog syndrome right now. I'm sure that a lot of you have suffered from this syndrome as well. All is not lost though. We still have our little mini dog. She's a six pound miniature dachshund that we rescued when she was very, very young. All right, stay away from the coffee, not good for you. She's 16 years old now and she's outlived three other dogs we've had. She's deaf, going gray like me, but she keeps on ticking. We'll let you get back to your nap. We've been slowly looking for a new dog. We know I'll never replace Penny. Ready to go look at dogs? Yep. This brings me to what I want to cover in this video. Dogs in the Bible. Dogs have been part of human life for a long time. They estimate that the first dogs were domesticated between 20,000 to 26,000 years ago. They've been parts of our homes, our families, and our work. They poop and they pee in our houses and we continue to love them. How people have viewed dogs across time has changed and across cultures as well. And we're just going to look at this in the Bible and the cultures surrounding it. The domestication of dogs appears to have been introduced into the ancient Near East somewhere around 3 to 4,000 BC, a millennium or so before God first made his promises to Abraham. Because of their hunting instincts, dogs quickly became useful for hunting, herding, and protection. We have depictions from ancient Egypt where dogs are depicted for their value in hunting. All of these useful traits are seen in the Bible. Isaiah 56.1 says, All their watchmen are blind. They are unaware. All of them are like mute dogs, unable to bark. They pant, lie down, and love to snooze. Dogs that have big appetites and are never full. Now I know Isaiah is comparing the people of Israel to dogs in a very negative manner, but we do see in this passage that they were valued for barking, keeping watch, and their company. Some authors in the Hebrew scriptures seem to have been rather dog skeptics. It seems to have been common in Jewish culture to insult someone by calling them a dog. Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog that returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. And when the Assyrian general Haziel is meeting with Elisha to be healed, he says in 2 Kings 8, 13, how could your servant, who is insignificant as a dog, accomplish this great military victory? Or, when Paul warns the Philippians against false teachers, Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. Philippians 3.2 It's important also to note that in the Hebrew scriptures, dogs were not considered unclean animals like pigs. Some historians think that because of the danger from wild dog packs and their scavenger-like instincts, they were viewed in a negative manner. The dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel. No one shall bury her, 2 Kings 9.10. On the dog lover's side though, we do see dogs often portrayed in a positive role in ancient Israel. One of the more interesting points that I learned in this study is that the great hero Caleb's name is derived from the Hebrew word Caleb. Caleb is one of the two spies who encouraged Israel to invade the Promised Land, and his name is derived from dog. Some have questioned why he would have been named this. But if dogs were also seen in a positive light, then his name could have been based on the faithfulness or other positive traits of dogs. In the apocryphal book of Tobit, we have two references to a dog. The young man Tobias sets out on a journey with his companion, an angel, 
And when he does so, the text tells us that his dog went with him. Tobit 5.16 And when his son had prepared all things for his journey, his father said, Go with this man and God who dwells in heaven. Prosper your journey and the angel of God will keep you company. So he went forth and the young man's dog with them. Notice how this dog is put in the same company as Tobias, our hero, angel, and God. Tobias 11.4 They went on their way, and the dog went after them, or the dog followed them. Tobias's dog is spoken of in a positive manner. He is accompanying the master that he loves on his adventures. When we look at the New Testament, we need to venture out into the wider Greco-Roman world because that will help us to understand a bit more about some of the references to dogs that we see in the New Testament. Way back in the 1990s, I was teaching a course in Poland, and I mentioned how the Book of Acts parallels the Odyssey in certain ways. And at the very end of the Odyssey, when Odysseus finally makes it back to his home, no one recognizes him, not even his wife. That is, except for his dog, Argos who jumps up with joy when he recognizes his scent. What's really funny about this is that the students told me about a king's palace just outside of Warsaw that had this story of the Odyssey depicted on murals around its exterior walls. I had to just go there and check it out for myself. And what's really interesting is the last panel of these murals around the palace, it depicts Argos jumping up to meet his master. Columella, a Roman author around the time of the New Testament, wrote extensively about agricultural practices. And in his work, he praised dogs for their qualities. He writes, What human being more clearly or so vociferously gives warning of the presence of a wild beast or of a thief, as does the dog by its barking? What servant is more attached to his master than is a dog? What companion more faithful? What guardian more incorruptible? What more wakeful night watchman can be found? Lastly, what more steadfast avenger or defender? The Roman poet Ovid, who also lived around the time of the New Testament, is best known for his book Metamorphosis. In book three, he has this interesting passage where he lists a certain man's dogs. Some of the names he lists sounds a lot like names that we give our dogs today. Tracer, Hunter, Tiger, and the one I like best, Spot. Dogs seem to have learned a long time ago how to curry favor with us. A great example of this are some ancient tombstones that wealthy owners had carved for their pet dogs with very eloquent epitaphs. Or on ancient pottery, we have depictions of dogs sitting under their master's table, enjoying the food that falls off the table, definitely part of the family's household. This parallels also what we see in the New Testament. In Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman in Matthew 15 and Mark 7, she cries out to Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus basically insults her and tells her that he won't help her because it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Matthew 15, 26. His reply follows sort of the negative view of dogs that we saw in the Old Testament. She then turns this on its head and uses a positive analogy to dogs. Yes, Lord, she replied, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. In other words, Dogs were valuable members of the family that are at their master's table and they have a love relationship with them. This is how she sees herself in relationship to Christ. He is her master and she has a relationship with him. To which he replies, Woman, your faith is great. Let what you want be done for you. Dogs were also seen playing a positive role in healing. Throughout the Roman Empire, there were temples for a semi-god called Asclepius, the god of healing and medicine. If you were injured or sick, you would go to one of these temples to petition the priest to heal you of your illness. It's a lot like how the people of Israel would present themselves to the priest when they were sick. Dogs were also depicted in these temples for Asclepius. 
it appears that not only did they greet the petitioners at these temples, but they would lick their wounds as well, offering compassion and soothing to the injury and helping to heal them. The licking of a dog was seen as sort of a medicinal or a healing type practice. I don't know about you, but I've seen where a dog's tongue goes and how they lick things. And I sure would not want my doctor bringing a dog in to lick one of my injuries. But I digress. Where was I? In Luke 16, 19 through 31, Jesus tells us the story about the rich man and Lazarus. You know the story. Lazarus is a very poor man lying at the rich man's door. He's been starving and longed for the food that fell from the table. Dogs were out there licking his wounds as he laid by the door. When Lazarus and the rich man die, the poor man is carried to Abraham's bosom and the rich man to Hades. He looks up from that position and he asks Abraham to have Lazarus dip his finger in water to cool his tongue. The story goes on from there, but I just want to consider the first half of the story right now. The traditional reading of this story is that when the dogs are licking Lazarus' wounds, it conveys just how bad his situation is. And they interpret the action of the dogs here in a very negative light. They see them licking his body, waiting for Lazarus to die so that they can scavenge his body. But given the background that we've looked at here with dogs and healing, then this action on the dog's part here may have been a gracious act on their part to comfort him. Also notice how Lazarus desires to eat the scraps that fall from the table, like the Syrophoenician woman's reply. This also draws our attention to how hard-hearted the rich man is. He doesn't even offer Lazarus the same charity that he does his own household dogs. But then in the afterlife, these ideas about dogs are reversed. Before he died, Lazarus is being licked by the dogs and he desires to eat the crumbs that fall off the table like a dog. In the afterlife, the rich man begs for Lazarus to dip his finger in water so he might lick it off like a dog would. A fitting turn of fortunes. Now I have to say that my interest in doing this study in this video was really stimulated by the loss of our dog, sort of healing on my part. But at the same time as I did it, this study has helped me to see new aspects of the text that I had not considered before. And I hope it's opened your eyes up a little bit to some of the riches in scripture and how we never ever reach the bottom of our understanding, but we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. Did you enjoy this quick tour through what the Bible has to say about dogs? Very exciting, isn't it? I'll also keep you informed on our search for the next dog. It's tough because we have to find one that will fit in with our little old lady here. Till then, we will leave you with the word of peace. She knows those few tricks like sit with short legs like this. It's really hard to tell if she's doing it or not. What human being more clearly or so vociferously? What, what human being more clearly or so vociferously? What human being more clearly or so Shake? Can you shake? Come on. You're not going to shake for me today, huh? All right. We'll let you get back to your nap.